Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We have a very interesting gospel lesson today. It's a gospel lesson that uh, uh, reminds us of the world in which we live. It's a gospel lesson that reminds us that uh, we have uh, kings and rulers and governors who um, perhaps we could say uh, try to be manipulative, try to gain their own way. And yet in the midst of this, we hear this message to prepare the way. To prepare the way. See, John's message is intended for the daily lives of both the ordinary people and the powerful people. John isn't satisfied with the way things are in the world, nor is he satisfied with how its citizens are living in the world. So his words help us prepare for the one who is coming, who is going to turn the world upside down. In fact, we're reminded that when Jesus does come on the last day, we're reminded that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. <coughs> regardless of what they say today, regardless of what they confess today, on the last day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So John's, so, so John's words help us to prepare for this one who is coming, who has come and is coming to turn this world upside down. And John's words tell us to examine our own lives and also tell us to examine our own hearts. This gospel lesson, though, it may sound a little strange with hearing the names of Tiberius Caesar and Pontius Pilate and Herod and uh, Annas and Caiaphas. We've heard those names before, haven't we? We've heard those names before because not only do, are they now pointing to Jesus who has come already in a manger, we, hear, we have heard all those names before at the end of his life when he died for our sin. When he died for our sin, for the salvation of the world. So when we hear these names, we should automatically be thinking of the Jesus who has come and the Jesus who will come again, but this time as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But while we wait for that time, as baptized children of God, we are all called, by, name, by virtue of our baptism, we are all called to participate in sharing this gospel of Jesus Christ with those around us. Just as John the Baptist was out there in the wilderness eating bugs, wearing funny looking clothes, um, had a strange diet for sure, uh, he still had a simple message. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was his message. The one who's coming, who, when he comes, every valley is going to be filled. Every mountain and hill will be made low. Every crooked way will become straight. And every smooth or rough road will become smooth because that is what Jesus does. Now, doesn't he? He removes all obstacles, every single obstacle that keeps us from God and his salvation. He removes them all. We say, I can't climb that hill. I can't climb that mountain. That's fine. Jesus takes it away. I can't, you know, I, I live in a valley and I can't seem to, to dig my way out. That's fine. Jesus will fill up the valley so you don't have to. The way is too crooked. It's too windy. I get car sick. That's fine. He'll straighten it out. Or the, rough, the road is a little bit too rough. I'm not uh, sure I can make it. That's okay. He smooths it out. Because you see, we are children of God. 
and he wants us to be his children. So let me ask you a couple of questions. What are those things that you do to prepare for Christmas? What are some of your traditions, some of your rituals that you do to prepare for Christmas? Maybe you uh, have a little nativity scene that you put out, a little creche that you put out. Maybe it's got lights in it. Heidi, this thing needs a light bulb. <laughs> it's kind of dark in there. Um, maybe, maybe, it, maybe you put these kinds of things out. Maybe you plan family dinners. What are some of those things that you do to prepare? To prepare for Christmas, that is, to prepare for the coming of our Lord Jesus as a babe in a manger. Let me ask you another question. What do you expect from this season? What do you expect from this season? Maybe from your relationships, maybe your relationships with family, maybe your relationships with friends. Or what do you expect from your relationship with your church during this season? I mean, these are questions that we ought to ponder. As we prepare for our Lord's coming, what is it that we do to get ready? And another question is, what might you want to change in light of John the Baptist's words in our text today? He went into the vicinity preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, saying, prepare the way of the Lord, make its path straight. What might, want, what might you want to change in light of this? Change in your own life in light of these words in today's text. And then my last question is, what would you need to do to make those changes a reality? Preparing is something that isn't easy for us, especially if it involves a little bit of pain, especially if it involves a little bit of heartache. I know something about that over these last uh, five, five, six weeks. Getting ready for something to happen is something that we try to put off. It's something that we try to push aside. Maybe if I cover it up, maybe it'll go away. <laughs> but we do have to prepare. Because like it or not, that day is going to come. I got a meeting tomorrow that uh, I've been preparing for for the last few weeks uh, that has been painful to prepare for. But the meeting was going to happen whether or not I was prepared. Thankfully, I am prepared. But are we prepared for that day of the Lord? Are we prepared for when the Lord comes? Are we prepared for that little baby in a manger? Are we prepared for the Lord's return on the last day when he comes again as King of Kings and Lord of Lords? That's what John the Baptist was talking about. That's what John was trying to get, the, to get the people of his day to get ready for. Now, we didn't read those, these, the following verses, but uh, John uh, is a graduate you know, of that Dale Carnegie School of how to win friends and influence people. Because the very next words out of his mouth were, you brood of vipers. <laughs> I mean, I mean that, now that is just the way to attract, attract a crowd, isn't it? You brood of vipers. Now I would ask, did your mother have any kids that lived? But that's me. <laughs> but he called them a brood of vipers. Who told you to flee from the wrath that is, wrath that is to come? You see, all of this business of preparing the way to make his, his paths straight is so that everyone will see the salvation of God. And I find it quite interesting that all of this is placed right in the middle of this whole section surrounded by governmental and political leaders. 
because he's, not that these governmental and political leader, leaders serve a purpose, but they help us set the date and the time of when all of this took place. But these same governmental and political leaders were also there at the end when Jesus was crucified and rose again. And so we, we look at these. We don't just ignore it because we know that these were people who were there at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and they were also there at the end of Jesus' ministry. And that should automatically get us to think of why Jesus came. Why Jesus came. It should automatically get us to think of the cross that Jesus came to die upon for you and for me, for our sin and for our salvation. So yes, Jesus is coming. We are looking forward to Christmas Day when he is coming as a babe in a manger. But all of this is wrapped around the cross because he came for this cross. He came, you notice, well, you may not see it from there, I can see it, but his name is written on it, Jesus. He came for this cross so that he could be nailed upon it for you and for me. And these guys, I like to call them Hanyaks, Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, Herod, the rest of them, Annas, Caiaphas, they're there at the beginning and they're there at the end because the beginning of Jesus' ministry, I should say, and the end of Jesus' ministry. Because this is why he came, after all, was for this, for this cross. For the cross that I wear on my chest, for the very cross that many of you wear as a pendant, for the cross that's there above the altar. He came for this. He came for you. Now you've, many of you have heard me say this before, that, uh, that little thing that we hear in society today that Jesus is the reason for the season. Well, yeah, that may be. But the real reason for the season is you. You are the reason for the season because Jesus came for this cross, for this cross here, because of you. He came so that everyone will see the salvation of God. So that everyone can have an op the opportunity to be a part of God's great plan of salvation. And it begins and ends with Jesus because of you and because of me. May God richly bless us and encourage us with these words. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may I keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.